Good morning and welcome to our weekly town hall forum. The Greater Macon Chamber is most pleased to offer these programs to support our community and our membership with best practices and ways to move forward as we reopen our community. I'm very pleased today to introduce our Chairman-elect Rob Betzel, who will introduce our distinguished guest speakers for today's program. Thank you, Rob. Good morning. So again, I welcome everybody to the event today and I look forward to a, a lively dialogue today. Our first speaker is Mr. Matt McKenna, who is the chairman or the chair of the uh, local SCORE chapter. He's a SCORE volunteer who's a Macon native and who's earned an engineering degree from Georgia Tech and an MBA from Harvard. He spent over 30 years as a management consultant working with multiple companies in the U.S. and abroad. The scope of his experience spans the breadth of business from strategy, planning, budgeting, and to organization and operations. Matt, um, would you share a few thoughts about small business and advice you might have for them? Yeah, sure. I think the uh, main thing that uh, uh, we've been talking a lot about, and Abel's going to talk about this more, is, is cash flow. Cash is king. And... Uh, people scrambling to try to figure out how to ma manage both near-term cash flow, uh, but also rethink the, their basic business model in a way that will uh, maybe help them not only get through this, but come out the other side with uh, some new or different revenue streams. So it's all about uh, cash and it's all about uh, being creative on figuring out how to uh, get different revenue streams. Thanks for that that thought there. I agree. Cash is definitely king right now, as usual. Um, our next speaker and our panelist is Mr. Jim Manley, who is the Synovus Market Executive. And Jim's been a lifelong banker who joined Synovus in August 2017 with more than 28 years of banking experience serving communities in Georgia. And Jim's focus is on leading regional banking teams and providing bringing the uh, Synovus brand to the making community and helping both individuals and businesses throughout middle Georgia prosper and reach their full potential. Jim earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and his MBA from Georgia Southern University. He and his wife, Catherine, live in Macon with their two sons, where Jim co is committed to being an active contributor to the local community through a variety of service organized activities. Jim, Joe, uh, Jim serves on numerous community boards, including being our uh, past chair here at the Making Greater Chamber of Commerce. So Jim, thank you for your service. And he's still an active leader using his experience to guide the chamber's new talent and workforce initiative. Jim, uh, would you mind speaking to how you feel uh, the focus should be on small business right now? I'm happy to, Rob, just happy to participate this morning. Big advocate for what the chamber does, uh, supporting the uh, small business community here locally uh, for over, you know, almost 160 years and counting now. So, um, my advice at this point would be, you know, multiple points. But I, before I even, you know, provide a little of some of my initial thoughts, I wanted to, you know, out of my 30 plus years of banking, uh, I've had the uh, luxury of spending the vast majority of that time banking commercial and small businesses and almost exclusively privately owned uh, entrepreneurial businesses. And I've always had an appreciation for the courage it takes to start and sustain businesses and also how critical they are uh, as part of our economy. Really, I, you could argue that they're the backbone of the economy. And I think the crisis and the pressure it's put on economic uh, factors here in the last few months has really kind of proven that. Uh, so did, I think today's topic is really timely and relevant. Um, and if your business is feeling a lot of pressure, I would also encourage you not to, you know, capital is a really critical component, but as Matt said, cash is king and cash flow is king. And don't neglect the treasury aspects of your business too. So we think a lot about loans, whether term loans or revolving loans. Uh, there are different types of, of financing for different needs and different purposes, but don't neglect the treasury aspects of your business. That idea of speeding up receipts, controlling disbursement, and really being effective at managing the cash while it's inside your business. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that in more detail today. Glad to be here. Thanks, Jim. And our final panelist is Ms. April Hornsby, who's a CPA and partner at Howard Moore and McDuffie uh, PC. April joined the firm in, 2000 and, uh, in 1997, not 2097, shortly after graduating from Mercer University with her BAA in accounting. She's become a shareholder with the firm in 2012. 
April's area of expertise includes providing advisory, audit, tax, and accounting services for nonprofit organizations and employee benefit plans. She also provides tax preparation, consulting, and advisory services for individuals and businesses. She's a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Middle Georgia chapter of the Georgia Society of Certified Public Accountants. She's the past treasurer for the Houston County Habitat for Humanity and a graduate of leadership making class of 2010. April's a member of the Macon North Rotary Club and currently serves as a treasurer for the United in Pink and the Macon Film Festival. April, would you mind sharing some thoughts as you sort of sit in the CPA seat as you work with small businesses and sort of where you're seeing things in this challenging environment? Um, yes, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is please be patient with your CPA uh, during this time. Um, one of the things I've really been appreciative of over the last three months is that my clients have been very understanding about delays. Um, our profession has had to change focus during a time that we're normally preparing tax returns or other projects to focus primarily on helping our small business clients uh, to obtain CARES Act uh, funding and assistance and help them calculate and um, apply for loans. And even that has been a really steep learning curve because just like everyone else, we've been learning this as the SBA has been providing that information and it's um, been a little bit of a moving target. Um, but certainly CPAs and other accounting professionals, we're pushing that information out to our clients as we learn about it. And um, I think that that's gonna be a big payoff for everyone involved. Um, during the process, if your CPA is helping you to apply for these loans, just know they may be asking you for some financial information that you don't normally give to them to prepare your tax return or, or even to do your bookkeeping. Um, but just know if your CPA is asking for it, it is something that they need. Um, it just might be a little bit different than what you're used to gathering. And then finally, I, I think everyone at this point is probably accustomed to this, but a lot of folks have had to communicate with their CPA in ways that maybe they weren't familiar with, um, rather than simple phone calls, we've been doing just like everyone else, a lot of Zoom meetings. Um, a lot of our clients have had to provide us with data in an electronic method, such as an online portal, when maybe some of them weren't quite as used to that type of technology, because um, a lot of accounting offices have been closed with everyone working, uh, working from home or maybe just not allowing anyone to come into the office. So I guess we'll go back to Ms. Yvonne now to let her begin the, uh, the Q&A portion of our, our webinar. for the chamber to stay engaged with our community. And I believe the subject will be ongoing, obviously, as we continue to look towards the road of where uh, CARES Act goes in the next phase, what are gonna be some of the policies in the state and federal level. And I really wanna make sure that our members know that this is part of what the chamber will do to continue to build a platform for timely and resourceful information. So I have a lineup of questions here and we'll start with the first one with Matt. I would invite our panelists to also include some of their opinions on where the markets are going as we look towards Macon, particularly in central Georgia, and what our members should be prepared for as we look towards the phases ahead. So Matt, for this first question, what should I do if my business does not qualify for business disaster assistance, but still needs access to operating funds? That's a good question because uh, our volunteer mentors have been working with lots of businesses uh, we've actually had a in big increase the last uh, uh, month or two in requests for help. And that's, that's a very common question. I think the first thing that uh, we do, and I'll in April talk more about cash flow, uh, but let's assume that you've got your, a good handle on your cash situation. Uh, the first thing we suggest is go talk to your banker. Uh, as Jim said, uh, uh, you should have a relationship with a local banker. Uh, 
and if they can't help you directly, they usually have some good ideas. So I would check with them first to see if there's any facilities, whether it be a loan, a line of credit, uh, or some other facility they could provide to, to, uh, to help get you through this. The, uh, uh, you know, many banks are being very creative in trying to help their businesses. Uh, and as I said, if they can't help you with, with a, a uh, specific facility, they always have good advice, and good, good things to listen to. Secondly, I would say, you know, come talk, talk to a SCORE mentor. Uh, if you're interested, if we offer free volunteer mentoring, middlegeorgia.score.org. Uh, you can come in there and ask for a, just ask to talk to one of us. And we can also kind of brainstorm and help you ideas. Uh, for example, just, just a couple of examples of things that we've worked with people on. One is for business to business uh, companies, small businesses are doing, particularly if you're a small business, doing business with a large company is to go talk to your customers about potentially getting some advances or accelerating their payment with you so that uh, you have a little more cash flow and vice versa. Obviously, maybe talking to some of your suppliers about stretching out your terms to them to give you a little more cash cushion. So as Jim said, it's that, tre that treasury function, really understanding that. Uh, so I would say the number one, uh, talk to your banker. Uh, number two, talk to the people that are other sources of cash beside the bank. And then uh, also in there, number three, if you have, still have questions, come talk to us. Great. Um, April, I'd like to share this question with you, is how can I manage my cash flow during the pandemic? Well, as Jim and, and Matt both said, uh, cash is king. And small businesses need to be thinking about, at least temporarily, shifting from a profit orientation to more of a cash flow orientation uh, during, during the pandemic. And as operations begin to ramp back up, your small business may be one that was completely closed for three months, um, or you may have been just operating at a fraction at full capacity. Um, so you want to, one, get money in the door, and two, try not to send money out the door, um, which I'm sure sounds really easy when you say it that way. Um, in practice, not quite, not quite so easy, but it, for getting money in the door, let's assume you're a business that, um, that operates with regard to, uh, you have accounts receivable. You perform the service, and then you invoice it. You really need to communicate uh, more frequently with your customers to make sure that you have a firm understanding of when they are going to pay you. Even if it's somebody that you know normally pays on time, go ahead and talk to them, hey, and ask, are you going to be able to pay this by the end of the month? Um, if somebody you've noticed is being slow to pay, try to get them to, to do at least some kind of installment so that you can plan and forecast. Um, you may want to consider for new projects going forward, um, requiring a deposit in advance. Um, or if you've got a really good customer and you know they're not quite as strapped for cash as some of the others, maybe offer them a discount to pay everything in advance um, or to pay everything as soon as the work is done instead of on installment. Um, if you're an inventory-based business, and you have some older inventory that's been slow moving, consider discounting that um, to get the cash in the door. You want to focus on only purchasing that inventory right now that you already have customers standing there asking you for. You know it's in demand. You may consider offering them a discount on that for being patient and waiting for you to get it um, in-house. Also, another option would be uh, to offer them gift with purchase, maybe a piece of old inventory for the new stuff that they're purchasing. And in terms of money going out the door, um, I think Matt and Jim both mentioned you want to try to defer payments where you can. Um, see if you can rene renegotiate longer payment terms, um, maybe possibly a lower interest rate. Or see if your lender um, or leaseholder maybe would go interest only payments for a period of time. Um, you want to postpone making repairs to equipment or purchasing new equipment that you might not need right now until you're operating at full capacity. Um, there's just no point in tying up that money when it's not immediately uh, contributing to money coming in the door. 
Um, also consider foregoing early payment discounts at this time. Um, if, if you can push something from 30 to 60 days and it only costs you a little bit more money, then that might be the best thing to do. Um, and finally, I know everyone wants to get their PPP loan fully um, forgiven if they can, but don't be afraid to lay off staff who are not contributing meaningful to your immediate business needs. Uh, you may have employees who, yeah, by the end of the year, you need their services, but right now you need to focus on paying those um, employees who are actually generating revenue for your business. Um, the PPP loan, if there's any portion of it that might not be forgiven due to, you know, reduced staffing, reduced wages, it's 1% interest over five years. Um, you have a good period of time to catch that up later. Those are great tips, April. And that goes right into another question along your line of thoughts there. Uh, it, there's a member who has asked, is there a formula or method I can use to calculate how long my cash will last? Well, there's no perfect formula that's gonna work 100% for everyone. Um, but I would start with assuming you're somebody who has less cash right now than you started with um, before the pandemic, I would use what, what people refer to as figuring out your burn rate um, to see how fast have you burned through your cash in the last three months, say March to May. And to do that, you start with your opening cash on your bank statement in March and look at your ending cash on your bank statement for May. Subtract one for the other. That's how much net cash you spent out. Divide that by three months, let's say that's $10,000. Then $10,000 per month was your burn rate. Then look and see how much cash you've got left now and divide that out. And that figure is going to be the number of months you have left with the cash you presently have, assuming that you don't get any other cash or you're operating at break even for the next several months. Um, that's a start. Now, just keeping in mind your historical payment patterns might not be good predictors of what your cash flow is going to be going forward. So I would also suggest right now look and see what your current liabilities are. What is due in the next 30 days? And based on the cash that you have now and a realistic projection on how much cash you're going to get in the next 30 days. See if it looks like you've got that covered. Uh, once you've done that, look at the next 60 days out. And then I recommend doing a, a pessimistic worst case scenario on your revenue project projection and also a worst case so that you can be prepared. Thank you so much. Jim, we appreciate your service in the community and banking has been such an important part of the economy here in Macon. We have a member who's, who has this question. I'm worried about my current SBA loan and other bank loans. Are extensions available or how should I proceed? Yeah, uh, so it's a great question and a common question, Yvonne. Uh, let's start, I'm, I'm gonna break that out in two parts. Obviously there's an SBA component to it and they, when, when they say other loans, I'm assuming they're talking about more traditional or conventional bank loans. Uh, so let's start there. So let's go back about 90 days. Uh, the suddenness of this, the scale of it uh, was caught everybody off guard. And so most financial institutions, primarily banks, but just to say, let's just say all creditors, fairly quickly responded with automatic kind of no questions asked deferrals across full spectrum of credit, whether it was personal, household, credit cards, mortgages, car payments, or over on the small business side, same same idea. We didn't automatically, you know, implement those. But if a client came to us and requested deferral, we basically we offered and accommodated that. And I think that's the case really across the full creditor spectrum, and that's worked really well. So, it, because at that point it's like you know it's it's sudden and abrupt, and there's some obvious industries that were impacted um, more. You know, hospitality, travel a lot of service related businesses, et cetera. Those are the obvious pain points. But it was really, we we're really uncertain at that point until we had a little more time could pass what the real impact was gonna be across a variety of different industries, et cetera, in the economy. 
So flash forward, you know, 90 days, a lot of those original deferrals are starting uh, to come due. And so what's going to be different about the process at this point, it doesn't mean that deferrals aren't available to you, but there's going to be a little more due diligence involved. Uh, typically, you might be asked to provide financial information. We want to get a feel for the last 90 days, uh, how it's impacted your business. To the best of your ability, we're going to kind of want to look into the future. And to, and, and to the extent we can do some forecasting, we'll want to do that as well. And so that's when the relationship with your banker really comes into play, uh, just having an honest conversation and assessment of what your current status is. And there could be, you know, more deferrals there, but it'll just be a little more rigor, a little more thoughtful conversation uh, for future. And so they could be full deferrals, they could be interest-only deferrals, et cetera. So that's kind of the outlook, you know, with conventional loans. Now, as it relates to SBA particularly, it's actually, the story is actually a little better. Uh, for some of you may know, and for those that don't, there are two primary SBA programs. One's a 7A program, and the other's a 504 program. 7A is a fully funded loan. Um, there can be some lines of credit, but fully funded term loan. And a 504 is a combination of a bank loan and a debenture, kind of an unsecured equity injection by the SBA that sits behind it and it creates a really attractive equity position for the bank as kind of an incentive to do, do the financing. So if, if you had a, um, a SBA loan in good standing, um, I believe the date was through the, through the end of March, uh, you're eligible for a six month full deferral. For a 7A, that means for the entire principal and interest payment for a period up to six months. And on the 504 program, you still have to continue making that bank payment, but you do not have to, is a full deferral on the debenture portion of the payment for six months. And, it, you know, at, at that point, there were a very few people that got 90 day deferrals before those uh, deferral uh, plans were put, into, put in place for SBA, but you still may have the ability to do an additional 90 day deferral after that initial six month uh, deferral period expires. So that'll get most businesses that had those those SBA loans in good standing should should feel pretty good about the ability to get full deferral on their payments through the end of the year. Great, and that leads into the second question and from a member, what is new about the Paycheck Protection Program? Can I still get help to cover the cost of retaining employees? Um, yes, you can, and I, I don't wanna, you know, take a uh, kind of still Matt's thunder. That last question is going to talk about what might still be available, but I can tell you that uh, you, you got to appreciate the size and complexity of what the Treasury, you know, sought to do when they implemented the, the PPP program and also the idle programs, the economic injury and disaster loan program as well. They had to be propped up very quickly. They used the, you know, uh, banking system as the conduit, which was very logical. Uh, and it was a Herculean task. Uh, and, you know, I don't know that we'll know what the if the desired impact uh, it, we we obtained that uh, for some time, but what, what we do know is that a, a substantial amount of capital was successfully delivered down into the local economies throughout the country, and uh, and you know we, we we felt pretty good about that. Now what we learned because it was done so abruptly, um, what we learned is that there were probably some some flaws and some nuance to the way it was structured, and so. To, to their credit, the Treasury has gone back and made some tweaks. And there's a few things. That, that one of the big sticking points was the fact that you only had eight weeks after you obtained a PPP loan uh, to, you know, expend, to spend the funds. And so that's been extended from eight weeks up to 24 weeks. So instead of a two-month period, it's really a six-month period, which gives businesses a lot more flexibility. Uh, they, there were just a lot of scenarios where it just wasn't prudent to open back up. Uh, you had, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, employers kind of competing with uh, some of their employees that had, um, were on unemployment, which had bonuses, et cetera. And there were some situations, it was ironic, where the employees could actually earn more uh, taking unemployment than they would be if they were actually employed. And if they were open too soon, uh, while some of the social distancing protocols were still in place, they weren't sure the business would be there. So again, to their credit, they went back and revised that. So it's given them some more flexibility. Another sticking point was the fact that 75% of the funds had to be spent on payroll-related expenditures. That's been ratcheted down to 60%. So you got 40% capacity to be spent on some of those other eligible expenses like uh, mortgage um, payments and interest and utilities and a few other, uh, you know, kind of related expenses. Um, the, the other 
big change, which I think is noteworthy, was the fact that those initial loans were designed to mature in two years, and now there's the ability uh, through through conversations with your banker to potentially expand that up to five years. And finally, there's a safe harbor period where if a business has the intention of keeping their payroll at, at a certain level or increasing it, has been expanded through the end of the year. So they some pretty meaningful positive changes to the programs that are going to give businesses that uh, were successful in securing PPP loans a lot more flexibility, and we think it'll help with the efficacy of the overall program. So I'm excited to pass that news along if you didn't already know that. Great, Jim. We appreciate that update. Matt, we'll conclude the questioning piece with the question, are any new disaster relief loans and grants available now, and what do you see forecasted as we go into the next couple of months through uh, the, the recovery period? I think uh, uh, Jim mentioned the uh, SBA programs. I think uh, I would make sure you go back and, and refresh your understanding of what the SBA programs are because I think April mentioned that it's been a bit of a moving target trying to understand what's out there. Uh, but it's pretty clear that uh, Congress is, uh, is really directing the SBA to get as much money out as, as, uh, as they can under the Congress guidance. So number one, I would re refresh your understanding of the, uh, the programs. You have till June 30th to apply for the PPP. Uh, so that, that would be my first suggestion. Secondly, there are a number of uh, funds available. A lot of big companies like Facebook and Google uh, are offering small business grants. You have some of the online lenders like Fundera, nab.com that have grants available. Uh, there's a restaurant relief fund if you're in the restaurant business that's offering uh, grants. So uh, there's a lot of those kind of things available. And if you go to uh, SCORE website, we have a uh, COVID-19 resource page, resiliency resource page that lists all of these, uh, all the programs that we're aware of that are over and above just your, your local programs. And uh, we do have locally, uh, some of our, our local leaders have put together some funds that are available just to local area businesses. Uh, and so I think they're still trying to raise money for that. So again, I would start with uh, uh, the SBA, make sure you understand those programs, check out, uh, just get online and check out some of these other programs through the SCORE uh, Resource Center and then through the chamber and other local sites, you can check out other resources available. I think back to your question about what's going to happen in the next few months is uh, I think we're all we're all trying to figure it out. Uh, the uh, as Jim mentioned too, I think we all admire and appreciate the uh, what it takes to be a small business owner, particularly these days. So I think we're all all of us are here trying to trying to be helpful and uh, support each other. I think the, the business community is being very supportive of each other as well, which is great to see. So hopefully we'll come out of this on the other end, uh, maybe yeah, if not strong, stronger, and with a renewed sense of what it means to be a local small business community. Well, thank you, Matt. And I wanna thank all our panelists today for sharing their leadership and resources. We're so blessed in this community to have this level of support for the chamber and for our members. And I can assure you that this will be a focal point as we go forward. In fact, I'm very happy to announce today that SCORE will be an ongoing partner with us as we continue to offer webinars, counseling, support chat groups for small business community memberships in our chamber. We're gonna to look to grow that and brand it. So this will be an ongoing way that we offer programs and delivery of platforms to build upon the most critical part of our economy here in Macon, which is the small business community. I'm also pleased to share that the workforce talent piece of the Chamber platform is, will be evolving as a major focus. And we're so pleased that next week for our town hall will be Cassandra Washington talking about workforce readiness and the talent development platform that we have in partnership with our Chamber. These are gonna be very important times to stay connected and to stay united. So we're excited about the fact that you join us for these opportunities weekly, and we wanna engage our community to, to continue to be looking towards the future with a great reopening format. Thank you for being with us here today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great weekend. We're greater together.